statistics of sexual violence extremely high in PNG. Bangalore Teachers College celebrates 50 years. And Sir John Guy Stadium, the new Hunter's home ground. This is National MTV News with Tokana Hasavi. Good evening and thanks for joining me again for Friday's news. Statistics on sexual violence cases in Papua New Guinea are immensely high. This was revealed by the Assistant Police Commissioner Operations, Jim Andrews, at the closing of a week-long referral pathways workshop held here in the nation's capital. Service delivery stakeholders have identified ways to strengthen links for, for survivors of family and sexual violence crimes. Family and sexual violence crime growing silently in PNG, but is common and widespread. It affects people both directly and indirectly, which then affects the human development and economic growth of the country. From 2009 to 2013, 30,000 cases were reported to the Family and Sexual Violence Unit, but in 2014 alone, 12,000 cases were reported, bringing the statistics to over 40,000 cases. There are also cases of victims who are pronounced dead on arrival by doctors. The PNG Royal Constabulary has taken ownership to lead the investigation of all family violence cases. This has also given the mandate to establish family and sexual violence units and offices in other provinces. If we want the communities to change, then we recognize that we need uh, to bring about the change for ourselves. The data on FSV is Im Im immense, as I can assure you. All that since uh, 2009 uh, up to 2013. From the workshop, stakeholders identified that PNG lacks accountability, counseling services, and the involvement of men. Operational guidelines must also be developed for survivors to be the center of focus. There must also be a different pathway to help children from adults. To eliminate human rights abuse and violence against women and children, the PNG government has become a signatory in the UN declaration. I think that FSV is still hanging like an appendix. We need to see some direct control from the department to make it a, a service that department seriously take to, to sustain. And I think further discussions can be held there. We'd like to see guidelines develop for FSVU. Our PNGC is working in partnership with Australian Aid through PNG and Australia Law and Justice Program over the last five years to address family and sexual violence and related issues. Stakeholders, including the Australian Federal Police, are assisting the Family and Sexual Violence Unit on how to attend to victims and survivors. Vasinata Yama, National MTV News. The fight to reduce maternal mortality in the nation has been strengthened through a recent partnership between the Safe Motherhood Alliance of PNG and the Papua New Guinean government. Prime Minister Peter O'Neill says important progress can be made through partnering with groups to combat issues affecting the nation. Prime Minister Peter O'Neill says too many mothers and their babies are not surviving childbirth, while others who survive suffer permanent damages to their health. While conditions are improving, the Prime Minister says true progress can be made through partnering with groups such as the Safe Motherhood Alliance. Through the Minister for National Planning and Monitoring, the government will continue to work with partners and the Department of Health to enhance the welfare of mothers and their babies. A forum facilitated yesterday at the State Function Room by the Parliamentary Group on Population and Sustainable Development outlined consenting issues relating to maternal health, along with efforts to improve public awareness in relation to reproductive health, particularly among young people. Mr. O'Neill said community outreach and education are essential for young people to be informed of their rights 
acknowledge issues affecting their health and at the same time help avoid unwanted pregnancies. He said as the economy grows and more opportunities are created, young people in the nation need to be empowered on decision making regarding family planning and their future. The forum received commendation from the head of state for presenting a range of views from academia, NGOs and the government and allowing the public to share their views in the People's House. Mr. O'Neill commended the Minister for National Planning and Monitoring, Charles Abel, for his ongoing work with Safe Motherhood Alliance and looks forward to further updates on the issue. An initiative of the PNG Parliamentary Group on Population and Sustainable Development, the forum was opened by West New Britain Governor Sassindra Mutavel and moderated by Dr. Judith Carrico from the PNG Women Doctors Association. Venice Night National, MTV News. Education Minister Nick Kumar says teachers' welfare must be a priority in remote parts of the country. Minister Kumar said this must be sorted out to keep teachers in the classroom and allow the progress of learning. He expressed this while presenting the TFF commodity component for Karamuri High School in Simbu province recently. While ending over the tuition-free thick component trial demo kits for Simbu province in remote Karamui district, Minister Kuman expressed that maintaining and improving conditions for teachers is vital in the whole process of learning. The next thing we are doing is to ensure that we improve the teachers' conditions. As much as we give it attention to the students, we will give the same attention to the teachers. Papua New Guinea continues to produce sufficient number of teachers to engage in schools around the country, but most teachers remain in urban centers due to the accessibility of other vital services like health communication and transport. The education minister said it's a priority to equip schools with learning materials but also crucial to give the best services to teachers as well. To make sure that it's conducive for students to learn and for the teachers to stay in the school during the academic year and finish the school system every year. Minister Kuman said challenges still remain for the government to retain teachers in remote parts like Karamui Teleforming and border areas of Gulf. Despite the continuous criticism of the TFF component around the country, the government is still rolling out the trial kits to schools around the country. Karamui High School is the first in Simbu to receive the learning kits. Jack Lapave, Junior National, MTV News. While well, one of the oldest teachers training institutions in the country will be celebrating 50 years this Sunday. Balok Teachers College in Lay City began as a teacher's training school in 1965 with a handful of students. Today, it plays a key role in producing teachers who serve in rural primary schools. On Sunday, Balok Teachers College will celebrate 50 years as a teacher training college. The institution was once a primary learning institution for those who wanted to become teachers. Its motto to serve was shown by generations of students who went out to teach in rural areas. This institution is very important in the sense that it is producing not only teachers that will go and teach the curriculum that put out by the government and the Department of Education. They are Christian teachers. Today, as the school prepared to celebrate its Golden Jubilee, its staff and students are looking back at how far they've come. It's a college jointly owned by the Lutherans and Anglicans. This afternoon, the staff were preparing to welcome Frederick Stolls, the college's first principal. First uh, graduate we had was in um, 1966. And um, all these years, uh, this college has been operating up till uh, now it's 50 years. In the chaplain's office are magazines produced from its early years, before the days of computers, each page was typewritten and each illustration drawn by hand and then duplicated. On Sunday, a big celebration is expected. Dignitaries are coming from all over the world, including Germany, where the first Lutheran missionaries came from. Balob Teachers College drew students from all over the country. It was a melting pot of cultures and mindsets whose graduates helped shape the early years of Papua New Guinea. Scott Waide, National MTV News, Lay. Lay police have caught two people involved in another daylight robbery on Wednesday. Close to 10 people armed with homemade guns and bush knives, stole phones and other electronic items from the CHM shop in the centre of town. 
As they were making a getaway in a waiting vehicle, a security executive shot the vehicle's tyres. Police later caught the two men as they were climbing the Lunaman Hill. They are now in police custody. This is the eighth robbery this month. The old search Baton Relay continues its journey in Lay. That's among stories coming up after the break. Stay with us. Good to have you back with National MTV News. Rainy Lay changed plans for the Baton Relay with the helicopter grounded due to weather and the trip to Finchhafen delayed. The Baton, however, took to the road around Lay City on a revised schedule, first stopping at Table Birds, followed by a relay through the Crocodile Farm. Keep the baton moving, it went on a series of impromptu school visits. Markham Primary lined up around the school grounds. Bugandi surrounded the fountain. St. Paul's Primary School in numbers were in their assembly hall, and the baton was passed amongst the world. Malahang Technical School and St. Joseph's got to see the baton, and Busu High had the school captain run it between the classrooms. With the skies clearing, the team took the chance flying by helicopter under cloud cover and skirting the dark sand coastline to reach Finchhafen. A welcome at the Gadigu Primary School and keynote address by Sir Jerry Nalu, a Team PNG representative at the 1963 SP Games, before a relay around the town led by other former athletes including Ongeng Denkeau, described as PNG's first Ironman of soccer. Children running with the baton chanted the town's war cry, Finchafen Mighty Coronos, along with chants for Team PNG. <laughs> then traveling out of town to Botang River at the Bound Hospital, a baton escorted along the track by a Sing Sing group. The baton was carried to the waterfalls, prompting some of the crowd to go swimming. With weather closing, it was a quick stop at Dragahafen High School, who had prepared their welcome signs, then back to the airport. A flyover of Scarlet Beach, named after a bloody conflict in World War II, and a zoom past the Tami Islands, completed the day's journey. The oil search baton relay continued. Now I've MP Giswat Sinuin today called on Police Minister Robert Atiafa to come clean on police accommodation, particularly in Lay's Bumbu Barracks. Sinuin said almost all houses in Bumbu were constructed from low quality materials and currently need urgent refurbishment. He directed the questions to Prime Minister Peter O'Neill in the police minister's absence. The question was asked during questions without notice in today's session of parliament. When responding, Prime Minister Peter O'Neill said police housing issues are well accommodated in the 279 million Kina police modernization program. He also said the government is well aware of the low quality materials that are used in the construction of police houses and appropriate measures have been taken to address this. Now, these measures include the construction of new houses for police offices at Bomana outside Port Mosby, at Waigani and Morata in the nation's capital. Uh, we intend to uh, take action on that, Mr. Speaker, once we receive the report. But uh, our commitment as a government to improve in uh, law and order issues in the country, include, including the working conditions of uh, policemen and women, and uh, provision of uh, proper housing for them is uh, going to continue. Uh, we will continue to roll that out this year. We will continue to allocate more resources and funding next year. The concern on inadequate housing is also felt by members of the other two disciplinary forces, the PNG Defence Force and Correctional Services. In Port Mosby, police and army barracks have become overcrowded, signalling the need to build more houses for the law enforcers. The police, housing the police housing program in the country is a big issue and well addressed by this government. Mr. O'Neill said police accommodation is being dealt directly by police department and he will be directing the police commissioner Gary Bucky to present a report on it. In a conference on Monday, Commissioner Bucky said accommodation remains a challenge for the force and he will be looking at ways to improve this. There is not enough accommodation for our policemen and women around the country. This is the biggest and the most challenging dilemma that's confronting us. Our problem as well too is we have young policemen coming out of the college and within six months they get married. 
The PM said the houses at Bomana are nearing the completion stage and will soon be occupied by police offices. He also said the Gordon's barracks in Port Mosby will either be renovated or reconstructed. Takla Gunga, National MTV News. Amnesty International wants the PNG government to urgently put protection measures for vulnerable women accused of sorcery. The NGO group says more women will be at risk if nothing is done to perpetrators who accuse women of sorcery. This comes following a number of killings in parts of Enga, Simbu and Western Highlands provinces. In a media statement released by Amnesty International, women accused of practicing sorcery are likely to be targeted by communities through cruel punishment like burning, hanging or hacking. The International Human Rights Organization stated that PNG continues to be a country where sorcery-related debt is increasing, while the government is slow in putting tough penalties on people practicing sorcery and those accusing people of sorcery. Amnesty wants the government to act now to see justice prevail. Earlier this week, opposition leader Don Polia called on the government to review the 1971 Sorcery Act and impose harsher penalties. Uh, take advantage of this uh, backward, stonish belief and start to murder people, especially women, I think they should be treated very, very seriously and they uh, should be punished uh, in a very serious manner. Amnesty International also want police to be at the forefront to conduct awareness and lead investigations in communities where sorcery is becoming an everyday issue. But there are obstacles faced by police when investigating sorcery-related deaths. And that's where the, the challenge is. The police do not have information to or evidence to arrest and charge uh, those involved in killing a uh, suspected sorcerer. And that is the really, real challenge in the island region. The fact that 70% of PNG societies believe in sorcery, the context of attacking women practicing sorcery is becoming common and creating a systematic violence against women. Jack Lapare, Jr. National, MTV News. And now we check out the finance news. The Kina closed unchanged at 0.3675 US dollars in the interbank market. And at Bank South Pacific, our Kino is trading at 0.36 US dollars, 0.4670 Australian dollars, 0.3242 Euro, and 44.14 Japanese yen. Looking at commodity prices at New York close, gold, coffee, and cocoa close the day higher, while copper closed lower. Palm oil, crude oil closed lower, while copper closed the day higher. And finally, on the stock market, the Dow Jones closed at 36 points lower, the ASX closed at 78 points higher, and the All Ordinaries closed at 69 points higher as well. And National MTV News continues after these short messages. Stay tuned. Three thousand schools nationwide did not comply with tuition fee-free policy guidelines. National Education Minister Nick Kuman told Parliament that these were schools which failed to submit required documents to access funds. To the tune of about 54 million. We paid 35 million about two weeks ago. 3,000 schools nationwide failed to comply with the enrollment census and other requirements like bank accounts. The Minister said the national government made available a further 54 million kina to accommodate them. These 3,000 schools were paid on levels. Simply because they failed to comply with census, student enrollments, census, and other requirements such as the bank accounts. There's some schools that's got the domain bank accounts. There's some schools that's got the accounts that are held by commercial banks. It's got many questions and questions that need to be properly answered. 352 million kina was set aside to cater for all 13,000 schools for the 2015 academic year. The national government has so far paid 185 million to all schools. 185,000 were paid in January 27. This is about two weeks before the academic year starts. The second payment were made at the end of this first term holiday week. That completes the 100% that is to be paid. 
to the schools right throughout Papua New Guinea. Mr. Kuman warned all schools nationwide to submit the required documents. In future, failure to do so will result in no payments. Fabian Hakalitz, National MTV News. The Australian government spent over 5 billion kina in the past two years maintaining detention centres on Manus Island and Nauru. This includes over 1 billion kina spent between July last year to April this year on their operations. A recent Australian Human Rights Commission inquiry revealed around 70 cases of sexual abuse in Australian detention centres between January 2013 and February this year. The inquiry has not investigated potential cases in Nauru or Manus as both islands are outside its jurisdictional powers. The Commission is now seeking further information from Australia's Department of Immigration and Border Protection. In Iraq, car bombs exploded in the parking lots of two heavily fortified five-star hotels in central Baghdad yesterday, killing at least 10 people, police and medical sources revealed. A further 30 people were wounded in the blasts, which were around seven minutes apart. The first bomb targeted the Babylon Hotel, where government officials often held meetings and news conferences, and the second hit the Meridian. Iraqi authorities lifted a decade-old nighttime curfew on Baghdad earlier this year, seeking to restore a sense of normality to the capital as security forces battle ISIS militants who have overrun large parts of the country. But the rate of bombings in Baghdad has increased since then. Insurgents seized the city of Ramadi, west of Baghdad, on May 17, in the most significant military setback to the government since a U.S.-led coalition launched a campaign of airstrikes against Islamic State last August. Well, National MTV News continues with True Guy Sports. That's coming up next. Stay with us. Tukai Sports. Welcome to Tukai Sports. Well, the world's most popular sport, soccer, was thrown into turmoil on Wednesday after seven major senior officials were arrested on U.S. corruption charges. The arrests came after allegations of fraud and corruption claims had been made into the awarding of the next two World Cups. The arrests in a raid at a hotel in Zurich mark an unprecedented blow against the sports governing body FIFA, which for years had been dogged by allegations of corruption but always escaped major criminal cases. UN spokesman Stefan Dujaric said as a result, the United Nations is re-evaluating its relationship with FIFA. At the existing partnerships and how the situation uh, evolves, but I think it's, it's early days, but we're keeping a close eye on it. The announcements have also sent shockwaves around the world, with the Women's World Cup kicking off across Canada next month. Canadians, however, expressed very little surprise at the circulating scandal. Finally, I guess would be the first uh, thought to mind. You know, it's uh, incredible how long, um, you know, that there's been a, a perception of corruption going on in, inside FIFA. And uh, to finally see some action on it is incredible. Tremors from the arrest in Switzerland reached across the Atlantic, with many fans also not surprised. This is something that's been brewing for a long time. It is not surprising. Anyone who has even had a casual interest in football, soccer, knows that FIFA, by its very nature, is always going to be corrupt because it is so powerful, because it is so all-encompassing, because it involves the world sport. Closer to Europe, and UEFA President Michel Platini said, "Enough is enough." Nous avons suivi, comme vous tous, ou grâce à vous, un peu tout ce qui s'est passé ces derniers jours. Et sincèrement, moi qui aime la FIFA, moi qui ai une grande admiration de l'histoire de la FIFA, moi qui suis cela depuis quelques années, je suis dépité. Je suis Écœuré et j'en ai marre. 
Enough is enough. In the Oceania region, concerns have been raised over the involvement of OFC President David Chung, who is a senior vice president of FIFA. Chung, who has overseen major changes throughout his tenure in the region, as well as within Papua New Guinea. Sources from within PNG Football and the Oceania Football Confederation have assured us that none of the members from the OFC region are implicated in these allegations which have rocked FIFA over the past couple of days. However, after FIFA having had allegations made against them over the past 24 years involving corruption and fraudulent activities, it does bring into question the popularity of one of the biggest sports in the world. Jeremy Mogi, National TV Sports. Training has intensified for island nations taking part in this year's soccer competition at the Pacific Games. Melanesian Saints, New Caledonia, Vanuatu, Solomon Islands and Fiji are determined more than ever to fight tooth and nail for gold and go on to qualify for the Rio Olympics. With the PNG women's soccer team being three-time gold medal champions, other Pacific nations are aiming to turn the tables around this year. Vanuatu's under-23 soccer team is under intensive training as they prepare for the Pacific Games. The squad will play two friendly matches against New Caledonia as part of their preparatory measures. All nations taking part in the football competition are aiming for the best, with the Pacific Games being the qualifier for the Rio Olympics. The Fiji women's soccer team are not taking their chances lightly. Coach Charlene Lockington says the team understands how massive the task is and they are now preparing to travel to Australia to play friendly matches against Sutherlands, New South Wales Koala, Makoni FC, Belkinen FC and MacArthur Rams from June the 2nd to the 10th as a lead up to the July Games. Current regional champions in women's soccer, Papua New Guinea, are determined to continue their winning streak. Winning a fourth gold medal at this year's Games is high priority and the girls are not going to make the challenge any easier for their fellow island sisters. The PNG women's soccer team are going in as favourites on home soil and with the rest of the nation rallying behind them, we can expect to see an eventful showdown of football come July. The winner of the Pacific Games will play against New Zealand for a spot in the 2016 Summer Olympics in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil from August 5 to the 21st. Sasha Pesilovo, National MTV Sports. The sports minister, Justin Chachenko, says the new Sir John Guy Stadium will prove itself to be a world-class venue. Chachenko made a surprise inspection of the stadium today to ensure the Pacific Games Jewel in the Crown will be ready for the handover on the 1st of June. MTV Shane Saroya has this report. St John Guy Stadium will host the opening ceremony of the Pacific Games, as well as all the track and field events. Um, most construction is just about complete. It's just the finishing touches now and clean up that will now take place over the next four weeks. As you can see here at St John Guy's Outdoor Stadium, the track is under its final completion, which is basically the icing on the cake. The stadium is ready and in the final stages of preparation, with the cleaning up of the venues due to start in four weeks' time. The indoor complex is also into the final stages of completion. In a day of positive announcements for the Pacific Games, Pechenko also said the Taurama Aquatic Center is on track after the two pools had been filled and tested. The um, aquatic center, Tarama Aquatic Center as well, is uh, the two pools, uh, pools are fully filled up. They're now testing all the filtering system. And on, in the middle of June, you'll have the first test trials with swimming, uh, testing the pools in the middle of June. And of course, basketball and volleyball will also be testing those facilities as well. According to the Minister for Sports, the Games Village is also ready with the finishing touches now commencing. Games Village, electricity's gone in, water's gone in, the whole uh, facility is now being commissioned and uh, looking forward for the 4,000 athletes and officials to go in there over the next uh, four weeks. And Bicini Parade has been transformed with grasses growing above and beyond expectations. There is now no doubt that the venues won't be completed on time. Sports Minister Justin Tichenko made this announcement today. He also stated that the venues will be handed over to the Games Organizing Committee on the 1st of June. Shane Saroya, National MTV Sports. 
Well, the SPP and the Hunters had their first look at the Sir John Guy Stadium today. The Hunters will become the first major sporting team to test out the new facility when they take on South Slog and Magpies on the 13th of June. MTV's Elijah Levette has this report. David Loco, the, Loco motion. the game on the 13th of June will be the first ever Hunters match to be played in Port Moresby since their inception in the Queensland-based competition. The Hunters will be playing in the best venue in the Interest Super Cup and this should lay a platform for a future NRL license to be granted to PNG. We've been to every ground last year and uh, we've had a look at uh, the, the new one was Townsville last week and you know they just they're tracks compared to what we have here with all due respects to the people of Queensland but uh, they are. This is a proper stadium when the people come here they'll know about crowds and uh, they'll never have crowds like this in Queensland although we've increased the crowds but never to this extent. Hunter's captain Israel Eleb said the boys are excited to play and a privilege to be the first to test out the venue. Uh, just from the side, from us the boys we're pretty excited to come over and test this um, field at the stadium and yeah, we're really, really looking forward to uh, coming over to Port Mosby, especially the boys like their families around here and up in the islands probably they'll fly in from Leh and up in the islands and come support us here but uh, we're looking forward to having everyone here and come support us on game day. Tickets for the game will be going on sale as of next week and will be sold at the Sejongai Stadium yeah. and Stop and Shop outlets. Tickets will be on sale immediately and you can get your ticket sales, oh, sorry you can get your tickets you can get your tickets at uh, all BSP outlets where you buy the Pacific Games tickets. Everything's sweating. It's a night game, so it'll be nice and cool. You'll have all the lights on. It'll be like you're at Suncorp, Papua New Guinea. You sabe finish. <laughs> it is said to be jam-packed on game night with approximately 15,000 spectators to attend. Elijah Levet, National MTV Sports. Sure does look like a world-class stadium. While well, True Guy Sports continues with cricket, volleyball and touch rugby. Stay with us for the details. True Guy Sports. Good to have you back with True Guy Sports. Well, today saw the opening of the first cricket pitch that is of international standard at Babukori Village here in Port Moresby. The project was fully funded by the East Asia Pacific Community Facilities Fund. The ground will provide the opportunity for the local village teams to train and to excel and improve on their cricket skills while training on a proper and recognised facility. MTV's Godwineki reports. The opening of the new cricket pitch, which is also the first to be launched in the country, was done by ICC EAP rep Jane Lizzie and Australia's women cricket star Alisa Healy at the Vabukori Cricket Ground. Alisa was the first to try out the pitch with the local cricket team and the students from the Seveseh Moria Primary School. She said she was honoured and delighted to be part of the event and also to be a role model to young girls willing to take up cricket. Obviously be a part of this um, pretty historic day for um, the local community down here. I can tell you firsthand that half of these, these little kids out here are way more talented than the little kids in Australia. They're so athletic, they're strong, they're fit. The launch of the new cricket pitch was described as an historic moment for the country by the Games Development Officer Guy and Loku. He said to have such a facility in the country for the first time is a great achievement in itself. He added the students, men and women of the community of the Vabukori village will be able to use the pitch for training and also to help find local talents that could one day be part of Team PNG. Vabukori is the first, um, first village to, to raise that money. Um, to build this pitch, so full credit goes to Heresy Thai and the Vabu and the Vabukori Cricket Association and the community. This new turf wicket will now put PNG in line with the rest of the world to play and train at an international level in order to attend big competitions globally. This cricket facility will now cater as a breeding ground for raw and upcoming talents and will also be used in competition by the local clubs. This means the village teams will no longer use concrete pitches to train on, but rather on a globally recognised facility. And now with the building of a new pitch, there's a lot more excitement in the village, a lot more boys and girls will be interested in playing this game. You know, we all know that cricket is, is not a cheap sport to play, so alleviating some of the cost of, you know, helping the village build a facility through the, uh, through the ground, through the ICC Cricket World Cup, will definitely encourage more boys and girls in the village to, to take up this game. Godwin Eki, National MTV Sports. 
The national volleyball team, PNG Amoa, are expected to be amongst the medals when the Pacific Games come to Port Moresby in July. The Amoa men should start as gold medal favourites, while the women's are now genuine contenders following their strong performance at the recent Pacific Cup in New Zealand. 36 days away from the opening ceremony and the PNG national volleyball team have set their sights on the Pacific Games. The team will feature a good mixture of youth and experience. Both the men's and women's team have been working closely with their coaches under the watchful eyes of head coach Marty Collins. Uh, this bunch of guys uh, is, is youth. It's a good team, well balanced in youth. Uh, we have uh, the likes of two young coaches, Vela and uh, Matthew. Following the Amoa men's successful tours of Thailand and New Zealand, the team is prepared for the games. The team has been preparing very well for the 2015 games. In a recent tour to Thailand, the men performed above expectations against world quality opposition. Now the target is to take that recent good form into the Pacific Games. The Amoa women on the other hand have much needed confidence coming off from their recent gold medal performance at the Pacific Cup in New Zealand. PNG Amoa's preparations for the games are well on track and the players are working hard to perform to expectations. Dion Kombeng, National MTV Sports. And in touch rugby, with the hype of the Pacific Games drawing near, PNG's respective touch teams head into camp for the final weeks of preparations. Match fitness and ball handling are some of the key areas the women's team will be polishing on come the games. Head coach Sue Salter is confident the team will perform on home soil. As the games draw closer for a number of the young guns in the touch team, travelling overseas, playing in the World Cup and now competing on home soil has captivated their experience. First time for me. Um, just last year I played low, or selected me, low Rabaul go play low PNG games. From there all selected me come to uh, touch PNG. We represent them, touch PNG go on low goal cup. Uh, Australia, the World Cup, from them to come back in. For some, the experience of participating in the Pacific Games will be quite memorable, like mother and son duo Diane and Samuel Vetu. With the success they have achieved at the World Cup last month, the PNG Touch team are in camp for their final selection trials. Under slightly drier conditions, as you might have heard, it was really, really wet, that we lost a bit of our pace. Uh, maybe under drier conditions we could have come fourth or fifth but very, very happy with the, the overall standings and especially with the ladies' performance while they're over there. Women's head coach Sue Salter said the team is well-rounded with experience and flair, but will be honing up on fundamental areas. The, the concentration isn't always there, uh, so it's a matter of making sure that when they're on the field that they are concentrating 100% of the time and not giving silly errors to allow the opposition to have easy touchdowns. If the opposition do lots and lots of really good play and they can score, then you have to just congratulate them. But our aim is to make sure if they're ever going to score against us, they're really going to deserve it. A final selection of a 14-member team will be announced in the coming weeks for both the men's and women's touch teams. Scholar Sengi, National MTV Sports. Well, True Guy Sports sends on that note the weather details on the other side of these short messages. Stay tuned. True Guy Sports. True Guy Sports. Taking a look at the weather forecast for tonight and tomorrow in southern region, possible morning showers tomorrow in Port Moresby, brief evening showers expected in Kerama, mostly fine expected in Daru, Popondata and Alatau, evening showers. In Mamase, mostly fine expected in Medang, fine weather in Vanimore, brief showers for Wewag, Wailei City to anticipate showers. In the New Guinea Islands, mostly fine, expected in Lorengal. Overnight showers expected in Kaviang, Kimbe and Buka to look forward to showers, while a few showers expected in Kokopo and Rabaul. And lastly, in the Highlands region, mostly low clouds expected in Mount Hagen, cloudy weather for Mendi and Wabeg, and in Garoka and Kundiawa, brief evening showers. Forecasts for small ships, but before that, there is a strong wind warning current for all coastal waters of southern PNG Indonesian border through Torres Straits and Daru 
through to Kiwa Island, Karama, Yule Island and all Milne Bay Islands. Looking at waters of southern PNG Indonesian border through Torres Strait, Daru to Kiwai Island, Karama through to Yule Island, Hood Point, Samara Island and eastern and western Milne Bay Islands, seas of 2.5 metres to 3 metres, waters of Samara Island through to Cape Bogle, Finchhafen, including Vitya Strait, Siasi Islands and Long Island, seas of 1.5 metres to 2.5 metres, Waters west of Long Island through to Medang, Bogia, Wewak, to Aitape, Vanimore, all the way to the northern PNG Indonesian border, New Island, New Britain and Bougainville, seas of 0.5 metres to 1.5 metres. And lastly, waters of Manus and its western group of islands, seas of 0.5 metres to 1.3 metres. Taking a look at ocean forecasts for PNG areas, Coral Sea sees rough with east to southeast winds at 25 to 34 knots. Solomon Sea sees moderate to rather rough with east to southeast winds at 20 to 34 knots. Bismarck Sea sees moderate to rather rough with southeast winds at 15 to 25 knots. And lastly, Pacific Ocean sees slight to moderate with northeasterly winds at 10 to 15 knots. Now before we go, as always, quickly recapping our main headlines again tonight. Statistics of sexual violence extremely high in Papua New Guinea. Also, Balop Teachers College celebrates 50 years and Sir John Guy Stadium, the new home ground for hunters. Well, that brings us to the end of another working week with tonight's bulletin. From the news team, I'm Tokana Hasavi. You have a safe and enjoyable weekend. Good night.